It wasn't the back-to-work week that Rishi Sunak was hoping for. He had been planning an autumn relaunch thanks to a bit of good economic news, inflation tracking down and growth being revised upwards. But instead, the week's been dominated by crumbling schools, councils going bust and a terror suspect breaking out of prison. Well, here at The Politics Hub, we've been across all of those developments and here's your chance to watch some of the highlights again, starting with my interview with the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan. Now, one woman has been at the centre of the political story today, and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't sure she was going to turn up uh, today in the studio, but Gillian Keegan, Education Secretary, joins us now in the studio. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's start off by playing the clip that everyone is talking about today. But we will get a plan, and every single one of them will be done. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that, no? So do you think you're doing an effing good job? I, I wasn't talking about me, actually, I was talking about the department. The job that I was talking about started in March 2022, so way before I was in. But what the department's done since March 2022 is taken a completely different approach. So the way school buildings are managed in the country is through responsible bodies. So they have all the responsibility for school building, finding out RAC, doing the surveys, etc. And because of, well, because of actually the leadership of Baroness Barron, uh, quite, quite specifically, as well as other Secretary of State, they and the department have basically taken on a full leadership role in surveying, question, getting a questionnaire to find out where Rack is in the schools, surveying all the schools, getting all the porter cabins, getting everything, so that when we had these incidents over the summer, I knew what the where where the rack was so they had done all that work so when we had the incidents and we could look at it they so they have done i think a really good job this, if you did all this work why is it that parents are only being told that there could be let's let's not beat around the bush here concrete ceilings collapsing in in classrooms days before they're going back to school i mean does that sound like a good so job? you have to work on new evidence so as you know i've you know, spent many, many years in business. And uh, that was an off-the-cuff comment, by the way, as well, which was, as you realised, I thought the interview was over. So I apologise for my choice language. But the the, the reality is the, the job that I we... Don't think, I don't think people are upset about the choice of language. I think people are upset about the complacency, the tone that... There's no why, complacency. Why, it, why aren't people thanking us for the great job we've done? When parents no, are it, worried I wasn't about talking, the No, I, I was school. not talking about people. It was the journalist. So, basically, in the interview, if you listen to the interview, I don't know if anyone will now, the journalist was like, why haven't you done this in 2018 or, you know, way before I was even doing this? So, well, Daniel Hewitt isn't responsible for it, is it? No, but what I said is actually the department has taken a huge leadership role. So they're not the responsible body for schools, but we have taken a role to really help schools. And I think... No, they're not the responsible body for schools. What, what do you mean? They're not the, 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 the responsible body for school buildings is the local authorities or the multi-academy trust. But you're but responsible what, for multi-academy trusts, aren't you? The Department but, of Education, but right? Everybody has a different role. Right. But that's so, correct, so isn't the, it? You're, you're responsible for multi Yes, trust. but the... So you are responsible for... I mean, to be honest... <laughs> everybody has different responsibilities. But you, right? Are you saying that you're not responsible for the safety of children in the classroom? Absolutely, I am, which is why we took a completely different approach that we've ever taken, that we've taken, and actually that every other country's taken, and probably we've taken in our history. So we have uh, gone out directly to... to First of all, in 2018, we put warning notices out and asked the responsible bodies to do surveys. Then we put guidance out and said, look, you need to go and do guidance on RAC and tell us where the RAC is. And we didn't think it was going quickly enough. So we then took a more direct role, which is the first time we've done it, which is sending out questionnaires to 22,500 schools, arranging for surveyors to go in. So we've now contracted eight building survey companies and then arranging to mitigate, which is getting porter cabins in and getting the propping in. That's something that we don't usually do. Usually the local authorities or the multi-academy trust not, would do that. I'm not sure about talking about how the problem first emerged in 2018 is helping your argument. I mean, that's five years ago. The new evidence that came over the summer, which is why we changed the policy, is three cases that came up over the summer. Um, and we, one of them was actually in a commercial building, 
One of them was in an education setting outside of, uh, of our jurisdiction, and the other one was a school in England. And what happened in those cases is there were ceilings that were assessed or would have been assessed as non-critical, and they had a failing panel. So that was the new evidence we got. So that came over, over the summer? Yes. There, there were three different cases. Three different cases over the summer. You were aware of the summer that children were in this situation, right? Ceilings, dangerous, parents worried about the classrooms, concrete collapsing. Well, no. You it, went on a holiday in Spain from August the 25th to August the 31st. Was that a mistake? Well, when I went on holiday, I mean, to be honest, for the whole of the summer, um, obviously I had to sort out industrial action, then I had to do the A levels, then I had to do the GCSE. So the first time I could go on so holiday. So we should, be, we should was that, feel sorry for you. Not at should. all. And I don't expect anyone to feel sorry for me. I'm certainly not getting that vibe from you. But what um, I said uh, was, what I arranged was to go on holiday that day for my, well, for my parents my dad's birthday um so it was a family occasion we went i said to them right um we'd 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 seen some of the evidence we'd we'd i said we have to speak to the inst institution of structural engineers i'll take my I, i've always worked remotely i mean i've you know nearly 50 years before i got elected as an mp i've always worked remotely uh, i chaired i chaired i well i re worked remotely on holiday as well i chaired the gold uh, team from there every day um, made the decision and I said if there's if it looks like we're going to make a decision that we we get something back from the you know from the from these investigations and it looks like we will um, do that then I'll just come back and I, I came back straight away well actually I came back straight away but I had to wait a day because of the uh, uh, air traffic control okay. issue. Um, I just want to show you the reaction of a teacher in Leicester when Sky's Becky Johnson played her the video of you from earlier let's just listen to this look at this teacher. Oh my goodness. And that's our education secretary using that language for the situation. What I would like to say is, please, Gillian, come and see my school. I worked from the moment we got the notice of closure in order to make things work. I am horrified and disgusted by what I've just seen. What would you say to her? Um, I wasn't talking about her at all. She's done an amazing job and everybody in the schools. So when I said the people who've done an amazing job, it's the Department for Education, the local authorities who have responded to the questionnaire, which is 95% of them, the schools that have acted very quickly, the school leaders that have acted very quickly, the propping companies, the, um, the companies that have provided the porter cabins, they are the people who've done an amazing job. It was very difficult to make this decision. This wasn't a decision. I know that that for parents and for children, it was a nightmare timing. But you only get the new evidence when it happens. It was a very difficult decision to make. I made the decision because I put the safety of children first. And the people who've done an amazing job are people like that, that you know, that head teacher there. Crumbling schools is a specific example of a problem that goes far wider, arguably beyond the responsibility of any single person or government. Some believe that it's unelected officials in the Bank of England who also bear some responsibility for the challenges facing the UK economy. Now, Andy Halday knows a lot about both of those. He was the bank's chief advisor. He also advises the government. And when he speaks, people listen. So let's hear from him. Uh, thank you very much for um, coming to talk to me. It's great to have you on the new programme. Um, I want to start off with mortgages. How worried are you about mortgage rates? Yeah, morning, Sophie. Hello. Um, uh, I am mm. concerned. We've seen a really rapid ramping up, haven't we, over the last 12 months, with the Bank of England's uh, bank rate having gone up, you know, over five percentage points. And the lion's share of that hasn't yet hit mm. people's bank accounts. That's coming through the second half of next year into the first part of next year. It's, it's interesting about the lag, isn't it? Do you think people really understand what's about to come? Well, I don't think it's the fully factored that in yet. I think um, the media's done a good job, I would say, of alerting people to what's coming down the pipe. But I think until it actually hits your bank account, until you're actually forming those hard choices, mm. what do I cut mm. to make good on the extra mortgage payment? I think we haven't seen the full consequences remotely of that in people's spending patterns. And what do you think the full consequences will be then? Well, it'll be a squeeze. So we've got sort of two forces swaying the economy over the next six to 12 months. 
one of which, a positive one, a tailwind if you like, will be falls in inflation. That process has begun. On the other side though, Sophie, the headwind, big headwind, is as the cost of living is falling, the cost of borrowing will be rising and that will squeeze spending in the opposite direction. I'd hoped, last time we spoke, I'd hoped for a recovery in the second half of the year due to the tailwind. I fear the headwind of mortgage rates will trip that up and halt any recovery in its tracks. Um, and by halting a recovery, what, what do you mean by that in layman's terms? Well, I mean, we've, we've, the economy's been pancake-like, flatlining for 18 months, even with the revisions, big revisions to the data last week. But the story of the last 18 months remains intact. Mm. That is to say, we have been stuck. Mm. Growth is absent. That means it would take only the tiniest of tilt for us to enter recessionary territory. So that's still a danger, you think, then? It's definitely still a danger. Um, I would hope not a sharp recession. Mm. You know, but could that rise in the cost of borrowing take the legs from beneath an embryonic recovery? I think it could, and that is definitely a risk. How, how big a risk do you think a recession is? Well, I'd say it's uh, uh, an evens bet, as things stand. Um, it's by no means baked in the cake. And actually, the economy has shown surprising resilience. Households have shown surprising resilience over the last uh, six to 12 months. I fear, though, that, that resilience has come courtesy of them drawing upon their savings. Mm. And that pool of savings is not a bottomless pit. We know that perhaps a third of households have fewer than 200 pounds in their back pocket for a rainy day. And that doesn't come close to meeting the increased mortgage costs many will face over the next six to 12 months. You know, come the autumn, we're into the autumn now, I would hope that my former colleagues at the bank would cause for pause when it came to the cost of borrowing. And I hope when it came to uh, the government, there is something in the second half of the year, perhaps at the time of the autumn statement, that can give a bit of a giddy up to growth by investing uh, in both people and in case and equipment and machines and buildings in a way that provides a firmer underpin to growth into the second half and builds that confidence, Sophie. I want to talk to you about that investment in a minute, but just to pick up on what you said about your colleagues, your former colleagues at the bank. So you're saying that if you were still you know, a voting member at the Bank of England, you'd say, let's stop the interest rate rises, the baseline rises. I'd have stopped a couple of rises ago, in truth. So uh, I think there's enough in the tank already by way of tightening. So they've overshot, you think? Maybe? I think there's a risk of overshooting, and I, I hope mm. there's not further overshoot. Mm. Um, because I think there's enough tightening in the tank already to take inflation down to the sorts of levels where people stop talking about it. Wait, you stop asking me questions yeah. about My it. My first one was mortgage rates, right? Yeah. Completely. And it has been the popular narrative now not just between you and I, but in the streets for the better part of 12 months. Just on the Bank of England, do you think in recent years the Bank of England, I know hindsight's an easy thing, but you did warn about it before as well, do you think the Bank of England printed too much money and that that has fueled inflation? Well, I think um, it kept on printing money for a bit longer than it needed to, should have done, I think with the benefit of hindsight, hello. You did my, say that. I did say that. Um, we probably did a little bit too much for a little too long. It sounds like a plot from a film. A trained soldier, last seen dressed in a chef's outfit, on the run after escaping jail by clinging to the bottom of a food delivery van. Now, earlier I spoke to Charlie Taylor, who is the Chief Inspector of Prisons, and my first question to him was how on earth this was allowed to happen. Well, it's enormously concerning, and, and I think one of the reasons maybe, and again, we don't know the details of this case yet, but one of the reasons may be to do with staffing levels at Wandsworth. Mm -hmm. And certainly we know this has been a huge concern in our recent inspections of that jail, and actually a number of other jails around the country. And if you haven't got enough staff, 
to be able to get the basics right. There is always a danger that people will drop the ball and make a mistake. And when it comes to things like security, it tends to be just about having really good routines. So I do X, you do Y, we make sure these checks are done. But of course, if there aren't enough staff in place, and that's something we flag up a lot, then things can just begin to go a bit wrong. It's interesting you're mentioning um, concerns you've previously flagged, because mm. I, I just want to read a bit of your report into Wandsworth. Mm. It was done in 2021, published last year, and this is what you wrote. Leaders in this crumbling, overcrowded, vermin-infested prison will need considerable ongoing support from the prison service, notably with the recruitment and retention of staff, as you point out, and also improving the infrastructure of the jail. I mean, that is damning. It is, and Wandsworth is, was built 170 years ago. It's a very old jail, one of the oldest in the country. It is in a, in a real state. Uh, it wasn't built to hold nearly as many men uh, who are locked up there as they are now. So large proportion of prisoners are locked in, in, in cells that were originally designed for one person. They're locked in with someone else. It's a sort of 12 by six cell, roughly 12 foot by six. There's an unscreened toilet in the corner of the room. Uh, their food is served to them in the room as well. Uh, and often they're spending up to 22 hours a day locked up in that very tight environment. Um, on top of that, we're seeing things like drugs finding their way into prisons in, 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 in large numbers. And what that creates is an illicit economy that then often is the cause of things like violence, people to get into debt and those sorts of issues. And that's happening in Wandsworth, you think? And, and that's an ongoing issue in every prison. Some are worse than others, but Wandsworth certainly is a jail that's always been difficult to keep drugs out of. So there's drugs and mobile phones in every prison, is what you're Indeed, saying. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the staffing levels and the concern about staffing levels, what does that mean? What impact does that have on places like Wandsworth? Well, when we inspected Wandsworth, there were, I think, 30% of staff were, were, were unavailable for full, for full duties. So whether they were off sick or whether they were on restricted duties. But that reduced the complement of staff who were available enormously. And what that means is that prisoners don't get unlocked on time. It means that uh, prisoners aren't escorted to where they need to go, so they don't get escorted to things like education. Um, but it also means that some of the basics just don't get done. So making sure people have got soap, making sure that people have got duvet cover, those sorts of things that they need. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It, it is a huge concern. And, and, and um, inevitably, when that happens, you, you, you get difficulties. And, and, and you lose control, I guess, of the prison. And there's a danger of losing control. I mean, generally, prisons are very cautious about letting people out of their cells. And that's what we've been seeing at Wandsworth because they haven't got enough staff to escort people out. People are just locked up in their cells for long periods of time. But the issue, Sophie, is that these people are coming out one day. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you're rehabilitating people by banging, up, banging them up behind the door for 22 hours a day is just simply fanciful. I think a lot of people will be wondering, why was this individual, a suspected terrorist, mm. in a Category B prison? I mean, no-one's ever escaped from Balmarsh. Should he be put it there? Well, again, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. The Secretary of State has, has asked for an inquiry, particularly on, into why that decision was made. And so I wouldn't be able to be sure about, about why that was. Certainly, we know that some lower-level terrorist uh, suspects could be held in, in Category B prisons. They wouldn't always necessarily go to Belmarsh. But in the case of that individual, I don't know. Mm. Is there a link between, as, as some would say, you know, this escape and a lack of funding in prisons? Well, it's hard to make that link very directly, but, but if prisons haven't got enough staff, if you've got prisoners who, who are being locked up for long periods of time, they're not getting to education, they're not getting to work and those sorts of things, there is a danger that, that these sorts of things happen. So can we, can, we, can we say this is directly to do with funding? Well, that's probably difficult, mm -hmm. but actually if there aren't enough staff, sometimes that is very much a funding issue. Um, more widely on funding, and I'm quite interested mm. to get your take on this, yeah. because, like, to be honest, you know, I interview politicians, Labour politicians will say, look, there is a problem with funding, the Tory austerity years cut budgets. Mm. If you speak to the Conservatives, they'll say, well, actually, funding's risen dramatically in, in the last few years, so that's not a concern. What is the truth? Well, when you find a prison like Wandsworth, it, it, it really needs closing, ultimately. It, it's not a suitable prison to you be should shut down, you housing should, people you'd, in. You'd the... shut down Wandsworth, that's Well, it, it, in an ideal world, one would. But, of course, uh, you need jails because you need to service the courts. We've actually got a, a crisis at the moment in prisons just in terms of population places. So there are only just enough prisons, uh, places available at the moment for the number of prisoners who are coming in. We started the programme teasing this arm. Whose is it? 
Well, if you guessed Theresa May, congratulations, 10 points, pour yourself a glass of wine, because incredibly, this is part of the former Prime Minister's official portrait in Parliament. I'm going to tell you how much it cost in a second, but first, we've been collecting some of the worst examples of public art. See how many you can recognise. Let's bring in Nick and Dawn. <laughs> that last one was Melania Trump. I can't actually believe that. Oh, really? That. My favourite is Ronaldo. Yeah, yeah. shocking. Madeira yeah. Airport, isn't it? His hometown, his home yeah. city. Absolutely Just awful. extraordinary. It's yeah. so funny. It is funny. Yeah. We yeah. know he'd have hated yeah. it as well. Totally. Come on, then. How much did it cost? It cost £28,000. <sighs> Well, look, I'm prepared I, to start I mean, a fight now. Can, could you give me a tenner and I'll put... Because didn't we miss an opportunity? Didn't she need to be painted yeah. running through a field of wheat? Now, surely yeah. it was... Isn't, what, the dance? Yeah, isn't yeah. that what we need to do? Or the dance? Yeah, that would have been better, to be honest. I mean, I'm glad she likes it, because I don't think it's that great. No, it's not. 28,000. One of my kids in Brent would have, like, loved that gig. Yeah, she's a better... Well, how can I? I'm no oil painting. But I think it is a very unfortunate depiction, yeah. as were all the others. I didn't get all of them. Who else did we get? We had yeah. the North Korean leader at some point. Yeah, we? that was a good one, wasn't it? And um, the, the Andy Queen. Murray. Oh, was yeah, that his mum who was next to him then? Do I think, oh, I think it was Andy well, Murray. Did, him, did Billy Bremner pop up at some point, the oh, Elise football know. player? I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm completely <laughs> lost. If you had 28 grand, what would you spend it on then? Well, Picture I of yourself? Or? Did, definitely <laughs> wouldn't spend it on a painting like that, to be honest. I do think I we have would to look at the money it. that we waste as well in the cost of living crisis. Uh, I'm sorry to say this, but mm. £28,000 on a painting in the cost of living crisis. And a reminder, the Politics Hub keeps going all day, every day, on the Sky News website and app. And if you scan the QR code, you can catch up with all the latest from Westminster and beyond. And we're back on your screens every Monday to Thursday night at 7pm, so see you then.